It's the mid-90s, Longyan in China's southeastern Fujian province. Zhang Yiming is sitting in his bedroom, reading. Zhang is in middle school, and he spends a lot of time reading. His bed is littered with music magazines and books. Yiming, I'm home. Zhang runs to his dad, who works as a librarian for a social science organization. He lugs in a big box and struggles to open it. Dad? What's that? His father smiles but doesn't answer. Zhang watches in awe as his father pulls out a large gray box. A computer? Dad, can I use it? Please, please, can I use it? His dad chuckles as he places the bulky PC on a nearby desk and sorts through a bundle of wires to plug it in. Sure, but first I want to try stock trading. They reopened the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Zhang is lucky. He was born at the dawn of the 80s as capitalist changes were sweeping across China. Fujian was one of the first provinces to open up to the outside world. That meant international trade, foreign goods, and a better standard of living. Compared to most people in China, Zhang's family is rich. His dad stands back and admires his handiwork. Okay, do you want to turn it on? Yes, please. Zhang steps forward and places his finger on the power button. He watches in amazement as the black screen comes to life. Although this early PC technology will quickly become obsolete, it will open a window of learning and discovery for Zhang. And that knowledge will give Zhang the power to change the world and throw China's tenuous relationship with America in jeopardy. From Wondery, I'm David Brown, and this is Business Wars. In the last episode, Instagram gained momentum as its founders Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger pivoted to a photography-based site, and Zhang Yiming got his start in coding, building the technology that would make TikTok revolutionary. Systrom and Zhang were both born in 1983, at the dawn of personal computing. Separated by the Pacific Ocean, they both share a passion for computers and coding. But though their childhoods could not have been more different, they're following the same North Star, the American dream. But achieving that dream will be a nightmare. This is Episode 2, Small Place, Big Dream. Nineteen ninety-five, Holliston, Massachusetts, a wealthy suburb 30 miles outside of Boston. 12-year-old Systrom is sitting at the family computer playing the first-person shooter game Doom 2 from a floppy disk. He's navigating a fantasy world full of danger. Using his keyboard arrows, he points his digital gun at a giant red demon and fires. His parents recently brought home the family's first computer, and Systrom has been playing on it nonstop. Kevin, dinner's nearly ready. Hold on, Mom. I just need to finish this level. Downstairs, his mom, a marketing executive, is preparing dinner in their large kitchen. His dad, who works in human resources, is reading the newspaper. Systrom finishes the level, the last of the game. But he's not satisfied. He wants to figure out how to make the game last longer. So the next day, he starts to edit the levels of Doom 2, coding the graphics to customize the playing experience. It's his first stab at computer programming, but it won't be his last. He'll go on to code at his exclusive boarding school in Concord, Massachusetts, where he soaks up basic computer science classes. In his downtime, he writes a program for AOL Instant Messenger that kicks other people offline. It's juvenile stuff, but he's honing his coding chops.
early 2005 in Palo Alto. Systrom strides into Zhao Noodle Bar about a mile from Stanford, where Systrom is studying management science and engineering. He's also taking more computer science classes and building a couple websites on the side. He's dressed in a high-quality button-down shirt and well-fitted dark jeans. He scans the tables and spots a much shorter man, wearing slip-on sandals, baggy jeans, and a zip-up hoodie. With his curly hair and pale skin, he looks like a high school student. In fact, he's a startup founder who's about to make a very interesting proposition. Sistrom puts out his hand. Hi, Mark. Good to see you again. Hey, thanks for meeting me. Sistrom first met Mark Zuckerberg at a San Francisco party a while back. Zuckerberg, who recently dropped out of Harvard, is becoming a name in Silicon Valley. He's recruiting college students and recent graduates to help him build out his new website, thefacebook.com. Zuckerberg gestures to the chair across from him and Systrom sits down. So, Kevin, I've been hearing about Photobox. Oh, yeah, it's a website I've been working on on the side. Basically, people can upload large files and then share or print them. At this point in the Internet, it takes ages to upload and download large files like photos. Photobox is quick to use, so it's become popular with Systrom's frat brothers, who upload and download photos after parties. Word's getting out, and Zuckerberg's looking for a way to get photos onto Facebook. Listen, Kevin, at Facebook, you get to be on the ground floor of something that is going to be huge. We're about to open up to high school students and then the whole world. We're going to be bigger than Yahoo. Systrom listens politely, but he isn't sure he believes Zuckerberg's hype. They finish their noodles, and Zuckerberg gives the waiter his credit card. But within a minute... The waiter is back. There's a problem. It didn't go through? Oh, that's weird. Zuckerberg turns to Systrom, trying to play it cool. Ugh, that's just our president. He's forgotten to pay the bill again. Things have been busy, as you can imagine. The pair splits the bill. But Systrom is not impressed. This guy says he's about to take on the world, but he can't even pay for lunch? He's not joining Facebook. 2005, Systrom, dressed in his usual preppy clothes, is standing outside the door of an office in San Francisco. He's just finished his junior year at Stanford. He nabbed the school's competitive Mayfield Fellowship by building his own version of Craigslist just for Stanford students. As part of the fellowship, students get internships at Silicon Valley's hottest tech startups. One morning, he stares up at a sign for Odeo, a podcasting publishing site where users can record their own episodes and aggregate them in a directory. Systrom's about to meet two men who will have immense influence on his next decisions. A man with dark thinning hair and thick black glasses opens the door. Hello? Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm here to start my internship. The man looks puzzled. Oh, right. Right. I forgot you started today. Yep. Here I am. The man is Evan Williams, the co-founder and CEO of Odeo. Systrom sits down. Just then, a long-haired man with an earring and a giant beard wanders in. He takes off his headphones and looks at Systrom quizzically. Hi, I'm the intern. The man nods. Jack. It's Jack Dorsey, a developer at Odeo. When he's not working, he tinkers with a messaging app on the side. During his time with Odeo, Systrom watches Dorsey and is quickly awed by his coding prowess. Over the next few weeks, Dorsey shares his knowledge with a Stanford student, giving him coding assignments and teaching him a programming language called JavaScript. Systrom watches Dorsey and Williams carefully. He notices that Williams is the first person in the office and the last person out. The work never seems to stop. But even Systrom realizes Odeo isn't really taking off. One day, Williams summons his seven-person team to his office. After a bit of a preamble, he gets to the point. We've decided to pivot. Jack has been working on a messaging service that allows instant updates. He gestures to Dorsey, who's leaning back in his chair. 
So we're going to call it quits with Odeo and start working on Jack's side project, Twitter. The team is caught off guard and Sistrum is stunned. But he's just learned a very valuable lesson about the startup world. Don't get too attached to your first idea. 2007, Mountain View, California. Sistrum is sitting in a glass-walled conference room at Google, where he's been working for a year. He's waiting for a young entrepreneur to begin his pitch about why Google should acquire them. The young entrepreneur looks nervous as he launches in. I'm here to tell you about a new app that's aimed at a younger demographic. It'll revolutionize the terrain. But Sistrum is barely listening. His mind wanders. What if the roles were reversed? What if he were the one pitching right now? His mind drifts to a job offer from some colleagues, product manager of a new travel tip site called Nextstop. Sistrum can't do this anymore. It's time to try something else. He resigns from his secure, steady job at Google and takes a role at the startup next stop. Sure, it's a risk, but he's seen enough to know that if you can tap into what people really want, the rewards can be huge. Systrom is making a radical change in his life just as the ground is shifting dramatically in the tech world. A new product is about to hit the market that will launch a frenzied gold rush among developers and eventually, it will rock Zhang's and Systrom's world. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. June 29th, 2007, a dark auditorium. Steve Jobs stands on stage in jeans and his customary black turtleneck in front of a huge screen glowing with the iconic black Apple logo. The room is packed with awestruck followers. Cameras are flashing. Jobs signals he's about to begin, and the room goes quiet. They wait for the tech oracle to speak. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Jobs paces along the stage. He chooses his words carefully, but there's an energy in his voice, hinting that he's going to play with the audience a bit. An iPod, a phone and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. The crowd goes wild. People punch the air with their fists. Jobs soaks it all in, striding the stage triumphantly. Apple's iPhone changes everything. Before the iPhone, there was the bulky BlackBerry with button keys that business people kept holstered on their hips, a symbol of success. But the sleek iPhone is for everyone. Email and the internet are readily available. The iPhone elegantly rolls a camera, an iPod, and a laptop into one device. But the iPhone can also download apps made by other developers, not just Apple. And in 2008, iPhone owners start downloading apps with capabilities that range from frivolous to indispensable. They can make their phone recreate the Star Wars lightsaber noise, play Crash Bandicoot, or read the news. This app invitational allows Apple to create a cottage industry of app developers. They're all trying to get rich off the next big app. And Systrom and Zhang are no exception. By 2009, Systrom is spending his weekends hunkered down in cafes, trying to learn how to code mobile apps. None of them take off. He makes an app called Dished for people to rate meals at restaurants. Then he hits upon a new idea. It's called bourbon. The name stems from Systrom's love of the finer things in life, like top-shelf Kentucky whiskey. Users post their whereabouts at bars, restaurants, and clubs with friends. Whoever posts the most wins prizes. Each update has a photo, but the technology is clunky. You have to email the image to the developers first. The technology might be cumbersome now, but those photos are going to be key to Bourbon's future. 
That is, if Systrom can stay afloat long enough for these pixels to change the world. Spring 2010. Sistrom is sipping a cappuccino in a San Francisco coffee shop. He keeps glancing at the door. He's waiting for Steve Anderson, an influential venture capitalist. A casually dressed man with strawberry blonde hair and an athletic build walks in. Sistrom waves him over, and Anderson takes a seat. Kevin, good to see you again. Thanks for taking the time. So tell me about your project. Sistrom starts talking up bourbon. Anderson waits patiently for the number he knows is coming. I need 50,000 to get off the ground. Anderson pauses to consider. Sistrom's iPhone is lying on the table and he notices it keeps buzzing with notifications. What are all these updates you're getting? Someone looking for you? I'm pretty sure it's people joining bourbon. Sistrom quickly scrolls. Yep, a whole lot of people just signed up. (laughs) That's too good. Did you plan that to impress me? No way. I wouldn't do that. This is real growth. Well, clearly you have something here. But I'm concerned. You're solo. And that's a risk. You don't have anyone to challenge you, to bounce ideas around with. I'm interested, but to be honest, I think you need a co-founder. It's an astute request. After all, the best startups have co-founders. Bill Gates and Paul Allen, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. Sistrom nods. Sure, I can find that person. With Sistrom's promise, Anderson writes him a check for $50,000. Then a Google colleague introduces Sistrom to Mark Andreessen, who writes him a much bigger check for a quarter of a million dollars. Now, Sistrom just needs to make good on his promise to find a co-founder. He asks around and eventually lands on a name, Mike Krieger. Krieger's also a Stanford alum who's already using bourbon. He has a master's in symbolic systems, a program focused on how people interact with computers. The two run into each other regularly on the weekend at cafes, each toiling away at their respective apps. Sistrom calls him up. Mike, you know how I've been telling you about bourbon? Well, uh, I've gotten funding, $300,000 to work with. I'm turning bourbon into a real company. Wow, congrats, man. Yeah, but I uh, can't do it alone. I need help with the tech and with the company's whole vision, so... I have a big question for you. How'd you like to be a co-founder? Krieger wants to build something new and cool for mobile devices, plus he likes Systrom. It's simple as that. Count me in. Together, these two are going to develop one of the biggest apps in the world. But they're not the only ones hoping to spin their bright idea and coding know-how into social media gold. It's 2007 in Beijing, China. Zhang Yiming should be on his lunch break, but he's coding at his desk. Zhang works for Kuxin, a travel startup that's like the Chinese version of Expedia. Zhang recently graduated from university with a software engineering degree. Kuxin is his first job, and he's hungry to learn. He's pushing to sit in on all sorts of meetings and to tag along with the sales director. But today... Zhang is trying to solve a simple problem. He wants to book an in-demand train ticket, but he doesn't want to have to wait in line in person. Online, they sell out as soon as they become available. The only way to know when they're on sale is to check repeatedly in real time. There's got to be a better way, Zhang thinks. So, he writes a program to notify him when the train ticket he wants goes on sale. He finishes up the last few lines of code and heads out to grab a quick bite. Then, he gets a message. New tickets are available. He quickly goes online and buys them. After work, 
He drops by the station to pick them up. That was easy. As he walks home from the station that night, he passes a construction site for a new housing development. There's a slogan plastered on the side. It reads, small place, big dream. It sticks with him. Zhang is from the middle of nowhere in China, but he believes in the American dream. And he thinks he can achieve it by using technology to improve people's lives. In 2009, he founds a real estate search website called 99 Fang, which translates to 99 Rooms. But he notices that all the users are migrating from their computers to smartphones. Clearly, mobile technology is the future, but lots of coders already know that. The question is, how to get out in front of this? Zhang wants to use artificial intelligence to figure out what people want on social media. If he can execute that simple-sounding concept, he can serve up a constant flow of sugary morsels that will leave users hungry for more. And when that happens, the craving will be both addictive and lucrative. Very, very lucrative. On the next episode, TikTok takes center stage when it launches internationally, and Instagram faces trouble at home when Zuckerberg rocks the boat. From Wondery, this is episode two of TikTok versus Instagram for Business Wars. A quick note about the recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said at the time. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on historical research. I'm your host, David Brown. Natalie Robomad wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Sound designed by Kyle Randall. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Hernan Lopez. For Wondering.